She is called the Jewel of the Orient. Ultra Cosmopolitan. Steeped in tradition. A luminous city poised at the crossroads of East and West. Less than one decade after the city's historic return to the Chinese motherland, Ultra I takes on a city reborn and uncovers its complex, divided soul. This is Ultra I Hong Kong. What makes Hong Kong Island so special is the majestic Victoria Harbor, arguably the best deep water port in Asia. Hong Kong's modern history began when the British occupied these islands to gain a foothold in the Far East. In 1842, Hong Kong officially became the British Empire's Asian headquarters, and soon it was the world's gateway to China. Over a century and a half later, Hong Kong has emerged as both Chinese and Western, a unique fusion of two worlds. After the Chinese took control over Hong Kong in 1997, Hong Kong people have been asking themselves, are they Chinese? Are they Western? What is Hong Kong's true identity? One thing everyone agrees upon is that Hong Kong is Asia's financial powerhouse. And the focal point of this financial might is a district called Central. As its name implies, Central is the nerve center of Hong Kong's prosperity, where the city's considerable financial muscle expresses itself in mighty towers of steel and glass. This is the superficial face of Hong Kong, ultra-modern and Western in its style. All the image and uh, perception that somehow we're still Chinese is baloney. A Martian flying over Hong Kong will regard this place, uh, when it's unoccupied, uh, as a Western place. Over the last 25 years, the world's greatest architects have competed to build taller and more distinctive buildings for their financial clients. In Hong Kong, architecture conveys power, and the race to build bigger and ever more exuberant structures took off in the 80s with two landmark buildings, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, designed by British architect Norman Foster, and the Bank of China Tower, designed by I.M. Pei. But it is a local architect who has had one of the most profound effects on the city's skyline. Hong Kong has always embraced the, the modern, uh, simply because as a city, as a place, we do not really have that much history. We don't have the Forbidden Palace or the uh, Temple of Heaven. We have no hesitation embracing anything that is newly constructed. So modern architecture, it's no debate. It's accepted just like that. It is a city obsessed with building new, and Rocco Yim is a key architect involved in Central's newest, most ambitious building project. Two 
International Finance Center, or called simply TU IFC, is the tallest building in Hong Kong and the third tallest building in the world. Still under construction, TU IFC is the locus of a new city within a city designed to change the face of Central and cement Hong Kong's position as one of the great financial centers of the world. In a city where time is money and efficiency reigns supreme, the IFC complex is designed to be the ideal one-stop shop for international dealmakers crisscrossing the globe. Business people can fly into Hong Kong, take a high-speed train to the IFC complex, and attend a business meeting in the stunning tower. All their business and entertainment can be taken care of in one place. This site is a meeting place. Metaphorically, this meeting place is symbolic of Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a meeting place. So that's, from day one, what I see is to be so significant of this development. It sort of draws and ties everything together as part of the city. The architectural facade of the building was designed by Cesar Pelle, who was based in the United States. The fingers at the top of the building are really hands uh, according to Mr. Pele, uh, reaching for the sky. And this, I think, very well describes the Hong Kong spirit. Uh, people always striving for something better, reaching for the sky. Even with all this Western design around them, you are reminded at every street corner that Hong Kong is part of Asia. Unbelievably, this amazing skyline has been built using bamboo. State-of-the-art skyscrapers are draped in bamboo scaffolding, an age-old technique that survives in Hong Kong. We still cling to tradition where tradition is of use. And the one thing which is most obvious is all the bamboo scaffolding. Even in a tower which is 30, 40 stories, you could still see scaffolding of bamboo going up together with the tower. And that is very much a Hong Kong phenomenon, that we keep or make the best use of tradition when they are still cost-efficient and practical. There's always this question asked of what our identity is, uh, what makes us different from New York or LA, and in fact, what makes us different from Shanghai. And one of the things, of course, that makes us different is all the traditional values uh, that although we don't have a physical history, we do have a cultural heritage. Respect of ancestors, parents, family life, celebration of traditional festivals. And over time, this has become something we treasure. Nowhere is this devotion to tradition more evident than in Hong Kong's mysterious temples, where traditional Chinese beliefs and rituals are preserved. Nestled in the shadow of government-built high-rises, Wong Tai Sin Temple is a sanctuary. The religion practiced here is a mix of Taoism, Buddhism, and Confucianism, with a dash of the supernatural. Wong Tai Xin, the god of healing, presides over this temple, but perhaps more importantly, he is also the god of fortune. Yeah. 
The pragmatic Hong Kong people, too cautious to rely on good luck, flock here to ask for advice on all matters from marital problems to stock market trends. Worshippers shake containers filled with cheem, or fortune sticks, until one stick falls out of the container. Each stick is printed with a number, which can be interpreted by a fortune teller on the grounds. Hong Kong people from all walks of life participate in this ongoing business of attracting good luck and averting disaster. When we return, Ultra Eye discovers Hong Kong's feng shui secrets. Hong Kong's obsession with courting good fortune has helped shape its magnificent cityscape. Lions of all shapes and materials can be found outside Central's banks to protect the riches within. They are part of an elaborate strategy to attract good fortune and deflect the bad, rooted in the ancient art of feng shui. Norris Ng is one of Hong Kong's most successful and highly paid feng shui experts with a thriving consulting enterprise. Feng Shui, this is a Chinese word. Feng means uh, wind. Shui means water. So Feng Shui is wind and water. But that's not the whole thing. The whole thing about Feng Shui is the magnetic force. These electromagnetic forces, some positive and some negative, are called qi. In terms of qi, Hong Kong's fortunes are a matter of simple geography. Hong Kong is such a fortunate place. The Victoria Harbour uh, is a good example of how the qi comes and stays. The water comes in and it stays quiet. When the water stays quiet, no big currents, the money will stay here and gather. When the chi comes and stays, that place will become a good place in terms of fortune, health, um, career, whatever, right? Uh, money. And this is what Hong Kong have right now. Feng Shui is something not every architect takes into account. I don't, uh, but many of our clients do. Uh, but I found over the years working with some of these uh, feng shui experts is that what makes good sense in site planning in terms of orientation, the sun, the wind, uh, the vista, the avoidance of sharp angles uh, would actually be good feng shui. Theories about a building's good and bad feng shui have become part of the mythology of Hong Kong. So powerful is the belief in feng shui that it is rumored that architect I.M. Pei of the Bank of China designed the building with razor-sharp edges to direct negative qi toward British headquarters during the city's handover negotiations. The qi will come out from that point of Haunted area, and it, it will go like a like a gun or like a like a knife. It will hit straight on a straight line to whatever object it meets. So that building, if you uh, go up there and see, you can see one of the angles are uh, hitting right on the the old uh, the residence of the Hong Kong uh, governor. <laughs> In feng shui, it's smart to align yourself with powerful neighbors. 
Chung Kong Center was constructed by Li Kaixing, one of Hong Kong's richest and most eccentric tycoons. It is said that Li made sure Chung Kong was built perfectly parallel to the adjoining Bank of China for optimal feng shui. I suppose business people, are, most of them, are superstitious because very often they rely on trends, on markets which are unpredictable, and therefore, in their mind, they have to rely on good fortune to a certain extent to help them succeed. This strong, pragmatic streak is deeply tied to the population's refugee experience. Historically, Hong Kong has been a magnet for immigrants in search of a better life. Almost half of the nearly seven million people living here today fled from turbulent upheavals in China. Shielded from the turmoil that rocked the mainland for most of the 20th century, Hong Kong has managed to hold on to many Chinese beliefs and values. And there is no place so quintessentially Chinese as Hong Kong's Jade Market. Jade unites both the spiritual and commercial instincts of the Hong Kong people. In over 400 stalls, merchants barter jade ornaments, pendants, rings, and bracelets imbued with an ancient, mystical aura. Jade is China's sacred stone, prized even above gold and silver. Belief in its powerful essence is as old as Chinese civilization itself. Even today, Hong Kong people believe that wearing jade ornaments imparts good health, good luck, and protection from evil spirits. Although these pockets of Chinese culture continue to thrive, there are those who fear that Hong Kong will gradually lose its Chinese identity in the rush to modernize. What has happened is that um, more and more shopping malls have been built, more and more foreign brands have come, and all the colonial buildings have been more or less shut out, uh, destroyed, abandoned, forgotten. Shanghai Tang runs against the pack with its vision of a uniquely Hong Kong style. Its creator, David Tang, is Hong Kong's most illustrious entrepreneur and designer. With Shanghai Tang, David Tang has single-handedly spawned a renaissance in Chinese design. There's a serious problem of our giving up systematically our Chinese roots in this city, which actually should be the most supremely Chinese city in the universe, in the universe. It's not as if we had time to attend to the you know, questions of sartorial elegance or uh, 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 artistic inclinations. I mean, just thinking about it is uh, incredible. Since the turn of the century, I mean, we've had the Boxer Rebellion and then the Taiping Rebellion, and then 1905, the uh, uh, stopping of the Confucian examination that had gone on for two and a half thousand years. 1911, the collapse of the dynastic empire that had gone on for 4,000 years. 1925, the First Republic, uh, which we had never uh, experienced as a Chinese nation. Uh, Sung Yat-san, uh, rather second-rate doctor from Hawaii, introducing and cribbing off J.S. Mill and Henry George on uh, land reform and republicanism and, uh, and, and democracy. 
and then the Japanese uh, invasion, and then obviously the civil war between the nationalist and the communist, and then of course the Second World War, and then the real fight, the battle between Mao Zedong and Chiang Kai-shek, and the traitor Chiang Kai-shek going to Taiwan with all the goods that America a, an American aid that was being sent to him, uh, and Mao Zedong winning almost by default after the long march. And then when he got into power, the Cultural Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution. I mean, it's not as if we had time to attend to social niceties during these hundred years of enormous changes. I realized that nobody had bothered to evolve a Chinese sartorial style. And looking at the clothes that my great-grandmother wore and my grandmother, they were beautiful fabrics, which you couldn't really find anymore. I took, for example, the basic Chinese jacket and I made it into different fabrics. We never had a sense of humor attached to uh, dressing up. And um, I thought putting fuchsia color or turquoise or something bright uh, would make people feel happier. That was how Shanghai Tang started evolving. We're not the mainstream yet, but we have got our exotic niche. Perhaps our angle is you know, everything is now so boring. Why don't you try something oriental? I bemoan the fact that uh, the culture here is getting more and more non-Chinese, and I cry every day that I see something more and more Western, more and more alien, and um, now nobody wears Chinese clothes. Um, my friend Johnson Chang and I are practically the only people, and we look really idiotic. Uh, but, um, you know, what can you do? Um, we're losing, a, we're fighting a losing battle, but um, um, let's have some, something more Chinese. The struggle to define Hong Kong style has gained momentum in professional design circles. For a century and a half, Wealth and prestige came from Europe to this part of Asia, and the need to copy styles from labels on the continent dominated the marketplace. The label, made in Hong Kong, carried a stigma, and this image has been difficult to shed. But times are changing, and Hong Kong is now breeding its own trendsetters. Hong Kong is the, the best place for shopping, because you can shop and uh, starting from um, 9 o'clock in the morning and until 11 or, or some, sometimes later. Pacino Wan is one Hong Kong fashion maven known for whimsical designs and a playful east-west style. <laughs> His boutiques are as imaginative as his dresses. I think my shop is like a fairy tale. I want my shops to become my dreamland. I do kids' fashion too. Because everybody loves fashion, even kids. The Hong Kong fashion scene is like this. Everybody is, is looking for you know, things imported from Milan or from America or from Japan. But now people are trying to find identity here in Hong Kong. On the street, Pacino Wan is hard to miss. His own vibrant style is drawn from the city's colorful palette. This is Wan Chai. This is really an old district in Hong Kong. So this is a restaurant have a 58 years history. So I came here for a wedding dinner when I was six years old. So I will gonna have my fashion show next month here. Mm -hmm. 
my coming collection. So it's gonna be a collection which has lots of colors. Shocking pink, red, gold. So all these colors, I think, means uh, a festival mood for the Hong Kong Chinese. Because uh, when, the, when people have having their festival or in the wedding night, so they would dress up with a bow pattern and bright colors too. This dress is for the young bride. His designs use delicate Chinese embroidery, but with a modern twist. So this embroidery, you can see monkeys, and then it is picking up a peach. But peach for the Chinese is, is uh, represent good luck. So the monkey picking up peach, I think is, is a good scene. I'm 100% Hong Kong. So a lot of people think that Hong Kong is only a um, place um, to producing garments. But I think I can prove that Hong Kong is the most fashionable place because I can do whatever I like in Hong Kong. It's Pacino. <laughs> yes. When we come back, antiquing and eating out in Ultra Eye Hong Kong. Hong Kong flaunts its ability to mix East and West, old and new. And hidden among Central's gleaming towers are old world mercantile streets that have withstood the test of time. Trade in antiques took off after the 1949 communist revolution in China that flooded the market with priceless family possessions from the mainland. Hong Kong became a repository of Chinese treasures, smuggled across the border, and remained so throughout the Cultural Revolution. With this privileged access, not only to the cultural legacy of China, but also to international ideas and trends, modern Hong Kong is in a unique position to create a fresh East meets West style. Hong Kong is a translator of East and West. We've been a melting pot of many elements. Kai Yin Lo, is one of Hong Kong's most revered cultural scholars, and her home reflects her love of Chinese art through the ages. Her eclectic collection includes innovative paintings. As well as sculptures from Imperial China, dating from as early as the 4th century AD. Her collection ranked among the finest in Hong Kong, before most of it was dispatched, on loan, to the Museum of Civilization in Singapore for safekeeping, in anticipation of uncertain years following the handover to Chinese rule. Educated in the West, but intensely curious about traditional Chinese arts, Lo took a foray into jewelry design, fusing her love of simple Chinese forms with a contemporary design sensibility. Just put together things in my drawer, 
antique pieces of jade, semi-precious stones, put them together. Her first jewelry designs were bought by Cartier, New York, and Lo has been designing jewelry ever since. In Hong Kong, Lo sees herself at the center of a stimulating cosmopolitan mix. It's a confluence of so many elements. A lot of it comes from China. A lot of it comes from New York or London or anywhere. Hong Kong is this accessibility to all sorts of information and currents in the world. Even in this city of constant change and adaptation, a few colonial icons have survived. The Star Ferry has plied these waters since 1898. It is the most popular way to cross the harbor, and with the city's notorious street traffic, it is still the quickest way to get from Hong Kong to Kowloon. And it's in Kowloon where one of the great colonial edifices in Hong Kong still stands. The Peninsula Hotel is a magnificent historic building that straddles Hong Kong's past and future. When the peninsula first opened in 1928, it was called the finest hotel east of Suez and quickly became a Hong Kong institution where Western travelers savored their first taste of the exotic east. The Penn's grand status has never kept it from getting ahead. While the lobby still whispers of a bygone colonial era, the modern tower which was built atop the original building in 1994, brings the peninsula into the new millennium. We have very successfully providing a journey of time. Where you travel, you come into the lobby and it's the, you can feel still the 1920s of the hotel. The staff uniform, they're designed uh, from the 1920, 1930 theme. And, um, and then you go up to Felix and it's completely different. The peninsula jets into the 21st century with Felix, created by renowned style guru and designer Philippe Stark. Every detail, from the chairs to the chinaware, was designed by Stark himself using an incredible kaleidoscope of textures and materials. The result is a harmony of intriguing juxtapositions, much like the city itself. So compelling is its effect that Felix has become the most photographed restaurant in the world. It's beautiful working within a Philippe Stark restaurant because of the way that Philippe Stark has used space and design for the restaurant. The beauty of the, um, the Hong Kong view, the lights, the city lights, it's fabulous. When you look at this view, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it in the world.
While the island may be best known for its bewitching skyline, a journey along its southern shores reminds one of Hong Kong's seafaring tradition. High rises dominate the shoreline where traditional market towns once flourished. And in their shadows, there are fishing families who still cling to a centuries old way of life. Countless fishing vessels sail in and out of Hong Kong's many harbors, and thousands of fishermen brave the oceans that their ancestors sailed centuries ago. In the city's many outdoor markets, merchants offer up the fruits of the sea in joyous commotion. Even in this fast-paced city, shopping daily for fresh ingredients is still commonplace. I go to different parts of the city and explore. That's why I know about all the little wet markets and all the baskets and baskets of fruits and vegetables. Food is very important to the Chinese people. Ten thousand restaurants in Hong Kong means you can have any cuisine you want at any any day of the week you want. Eating in Hong Kong is an experience for all but the squeamish. It is said that any creature that shows its back to the heavens is acceptable to a Cantonese cook. Like most experiences in Hong Kong, dining at a popular local restaurant is a lively feast for the senses. And this restaurant called Dao Hung is the restaurant of choice for food-crazy locals. Some call it Chinese fondue, but instead of melted cheese, the signature dish of Hong Kong is the hot pot, a steaming, simmering broth in the center of the table. An array of thinly sliced raw meats, seafood, and vegetables are dropped into the broth to simmer and then scooped out once they are tender and infused with the soup's flavors. This is fast food, Hong Kong style, fantastically fresh, flash fried to retain the food's natural flavors, and embellished with luxurious sauces. Dao Hung is famous not only for its fresh food, but also for its spotless kitchens. A rigorous code of cleanliness and discipline adopted from Japan transforms this gigantic kitchen into a dynamic assembly line of tasty dishes. When we return, Ultra Eye Hong Kong will discover East West style.
Entrepreneur David Tang pushes Chinese tradition at Shanghai Tang. But at the posh China Club in Central, his style is pure fusion. A members-only social and dining club for Hong Kong's elite, the China Club displays a stylish mix of Western and Eastern sensibilities that clearly reflects Tang's personality and ideals. China Club. That was really my wish to create a theater. You know, if, if people were bored during the day, going to their offices and so forth, would it be marvelous if they actually went out to dinner and, and, uh, and be in a sort of slight theater uh, with lots of nice pictures to look at and uh, wonderful furniture and an evocation of the old. China Club is really a place where, for a change, I was able to have on the wall pictures, I mean, actual paintings by artists, uh, mostly contemporary, living, Chinese artists. I just think this culture of wanting to be curious about the arts, uh, the visual arts, uh, and books, uh, all those things are very important. It is like traditional ancient China. Unless you had a Lyle in your home, you're not really regarded as a scholar or a gentleman. Tang's personal collection of 6,000 books on China and its people can be enjoyed in a typically English worn leather warmth. It's this idea of historical continuity, some nostalgia, some aspect of history from which we never learn. You have a lot of jealousies, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, um, the China Club, the Shanghai Tang, they're really just too con of the Westerner, uh, and, and I get a lot of that. Uh, but they're businesses as well, you know, I, I don't really care. I mean, Mao Zedong said, uh, not Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping said, it doesn't matter about the color of the cat as long as it catches mice. So if they pay, I mean, who cares? I don't care if they're brown or yellow or white. I am trying to survive on a business that is based on something that I feel passionate about. And if I can perpetuate that, that is a great fortune to me, as far as I'm concerned. If nobody visits the China Club, if nobody buys anything from the Shanghai Tang, and they are not sustainable as businesses, it would be much more of an uphill struggle for me to want to demonstrate to people that in fact, that is my vision for a Hong Kong that actually ought to be by far the most Chinese conscious city in the whole of China. Sunday is a day of rest in Hong Kong, but it is also the day when traces of old China come to life. On the grounds of the Hong Kong Museum of Art, sword dancers enact a traditional Chinese martial art form called Tai Chi Jian. Rooted in ancient fighting maneuvers, it has evolved into a stylized sport infused with a religious mysticism that stresses vigor, strength, rhythm, and harmony in the movements of the body.
this city of contrasts, a mysterious harmony links old and new. This is the Cattle Depot Artist Village, and although the buildings are traditional, the artwork is utterly cutting edge. In the 80s, with the handover looming, Hong Kong's cultural identity became a pressing issue, and artists struggled with it in their own ways. Ellen Paw is an internationally recognized video artist and the founder and artistic director of the media artist collective, Videotage. During the 80s, we start to have a discussion of uh, the handover. And, and then, at that time, we realized that we are not, well, we have to separate from the history now. We have to go back to some, some other place that we don't know. So from, from there, a lot of people um, have to express themselves through their artwork. Paul produced a short film called Diversion, which explored her anxieties about Hong Kong's return to China. It's about the psychology of the people living in Hong Kong, uh, the feeling about going back to China and feeling of instability or the feeling of breaking through. There's a very complex feeling in it. I try to find some historical film from the government, the Cross Harbor competition, and try to use it as a metaphor for the transition. I was born in the 60s. I know the hippies culture and then I know the psychedelic and I know the punk and I consider myself influenced more by the Western culture because I don't know what is happening happening in, in China and I cannot follow their culture or I don't know you know so I, I, I consider myself yeah a, more a Western person than a Chinese person. If you trace the history, there is actually a lot of contemporary artists coming out in the 80s. The reason is there are a lot of discussion about the cultural identity, you know, who is Hong Kong people. The Hong Kong Museum of Art is leading the debate on what it means to be a Hong Kong artist. A walkthrough of the cutting-edge exhibition, Hong Kong Cityscapes, reveals the myriad ways local artists ride the city's shifting cross-cultural currents. The reason why I use cityscape is because of the, the predominance of the landscape theme in the whole of Chinese art. So what happened to the landscape? For China, landscape has another symbolism similar to the West, but more overt in China. Landscape, mountains and rivers is a symbol of nationhood. of urban living that had prompted the emergence of these paintings. And the conceptualization really stemmed from my own background as a 
person living in Hong Kong with concern for locality and contemporaneity, how a city like Hong Kong, with our first few generations so deeply rooted in Chinese culture, and then with this gradual change of experience, moving into the 21st century, and what is the different perception and aspiration of people who's, who were born in China and who are born in Hong Kong, how they perceive themselves. Hong Kong cityscape, on broader term, is just how artists choose to relate themselves to the world. Most striking are the paintings of Wilson Xie, who marries traditional Chinese ink brush painting on silk with a totally fresh contemporary aesthetic. He did this very meticulous traditional figures, fine lines and pigmentation very carefully laid out, all in the traditional form. But if you look at the title and you look at the painting very carefully, you can see an amalgamation of European influence, American influence, Japanese influence, things that come from the cyber world and activities of young people. The stylistic reference is very Chinese. But the sensibilities is totally non-traditional. Everywhere his painting turns up and a closer look, critics would be so amazed by his ability to galvanize all this diversity, sensibilities. Everything from modern sleek to Chinese eccentric, Hong Kong remains true to its complex cosmopolitan personality. It is a city like no other, singularly balanced to translate influences from the East and from the West. A glittering metropolis at the crossroads of many worlds. <laughs>